Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Gallagher. I'm president of the American Scandinavian Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's book talk, The Swedish Theory of Love, Individuals, Individualism and Social Trust in Modern Sweden. The book is available outside uh, if you'd like to purchase it afterwards. Um, it's a real pleasure to have with us the co-author of this book, Lars Tregar. Uh, Lars is a, a particular friend of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and I really uh, am very pleased to be welcoming here, him here in person. He starred, or uh, I guess was featured, in three podcasts that we did during COVID discussing the Swedish response to COVID, and they were among the most popular. So it's great to see you here in person and to hear about this book. Uh, it's also very, very nice to be able to point to the fact that he is one of our ASF fellows, as is our moderator, Anna Christina Shearer. And Lars was a two-time fellow, 1989 and 1998, and Anna Christina much more recently, 2020, I believe, at Columbia University. So it's great to have you both with us. And uh, sadly, we are not joined by Henrik Berggren, the other co-author of the book, who has been held up in transit, I guess, at Rochester Airport, right? So too bad, but I'm sure Lars will handle it very well for both of them. So at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Camilla Melander, who is the uh, Consul General of Sweden here in New York, and she will more fully introduce the program. Camilla? Thank you so much, Ed. And I'm very honored to have been asked to introduce um, Lars Tregård here tonight. Uh, we were hoping that Henrik was going to be here as well, but um, unfortunately not. Uh, so uh, Lars left Sweden, or fled, as he put it, <laughs> at quite a young age. Um, he decided already when he was 14 years old that he was going to move to the United States. Uh, uh, he felt that the climate of conversation in, in Sweden in the 1970s was a little bit narrow-minded. Uh, and he described the fantastic feeling when he was standing on the ship entering New York and seeing the Statue of Liberty and this Manhattan skyline, and he felt that this is something he wanted to be part of. Uh, and Lars has lived in the United States uh, since the 1970s, and he got his PhD uh, at Berkeley and worked as a professor of history at uh, Barnard College at Columbia University. And he returned back to Sweden only 10 years ago, thanks to his American wife, who thought that uh, Sweden was an interesting project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Lars has written numerous books about um, Sweden and Swedish society. Uh, and uh, I think um, um, you told me that Lars, uh, you met Henrik at Berkeley, and um, um, I think uh, few people have been able to look at Sweden with sharper eyes than Lars and Henrik. Uh, and I think it's only when you dissociate yourself um, from the country of birth that you can get this outside view and see trends more clearly and uh, make a non-biased comparison between, as it is now, Sweden and the US. So um, uh, Lars says, and Henrik have taken a great interest in what creates and builds trust in our societies. Um, and an equally interesting question is whether um, the authorities have a trust in their citizens. I'm not going to go into that or venture into that. I'm going to leave that to you, uh, Anna, to moderate the discussion. Um, uh, today's moderator is Anna Christine Schirer, who is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Anthropology uh, and uh, a certificate fellow uh, with the Institute for Study of Human Rights at Columbia University. And your recent research focuses on racial exclusion in international law and the colonial origins of neutrality politics in Scandinavia. And you have broader interests in critical legal theory and humanitarianism, uh, racial capitalism, and settler colonialism. So I think it's a perfect match between the two of you. Uh, and your writing has won prizes and honorary mentions from the Association of Political and Legal Anthropology and the Society of Latin American and Caribbean Anthropology. And your research has been generously funded, as was mentioned also here, I think, by the National Science Foundation, the Wennegren Foundation, and the American Scandinavian Foundation.
So I leave it to the two of you to take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Camilla. <laughs> Uh, thank you, first of all, to everyone who have showed up. We are very pleased to see everyone here. Uh, thank you to the American Scandinavian Foundation, uh, and especially Kyle, Sally, and Monica, um, everyone behind the scene, um, and for inviting me to moderate this um, book discussion today. Thank you, Lars, for visiting us in New York City and for being available to speak about your book. Um, and a special thank you I actually also want to send out to the book translator Stephen Donovan who has made uh, uh, this book um, available to be read in English. The translators do a lot of work. Um, okay, so we will spend the next hour or so together, and I'll begin first by asking Lush a few clarifying questions about the main arguments in the book. This should take about the first half an hour. And for the second part, we'll go a little deeper into some of the tensions in the book. And finally, as I mentioned, we hope to have about five to 10 minutes of a Q&A. Um, but Lars, as we spoke about, to start off the conversation and to get all of us here on the same page, I would like to ask you to briefly summarize the book argument and the structure of the book, or the key argument and the structure of the book, please. Um, okay, yeah. Um, again, also, I just want to say my thanks as well. I'll try to be brief, but it's great to be here. You know, I have a, a, a long, nice experience with the foundation here, so it's always special to, to come back here. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I put together a couple of slides just to sort of make it a little easier, both for me and for you. Uh, this is just the name of the book, so we'll just move right along. What the book tries to do is to unearth the underlying um, moral and political logic of modern Sweden. And uh, so we, we start by thinking about uh, the Swedish social contract, right? Social contract, kind of a classic idea going back to Enlightenment philosophers, uh, which is, of course, not a contract literally, but it's the kind of assumptions and expectations and values that underlie relations between people in a society as well as the, the relationship to um, the state, to, to the rule of law and so forth. And um, in doing so, we established two key concepts that we use to try to think it through. Uh, one is statist individualism. This is this particular connection between state and individual that is so characteristic for Sweden and arguably the other Nordic countries as well. And I'll say more about that in a second. Um, that is the kind of institutional from above perspective on, on how we can understand Sweden, the institution building. Um, at the same time, it's important to remember that modern Sweden, you know, if we're thinking about a period from roughly the 1920s to the 1970s, that, that period was also the period when Sweden was being democratized. Right? So to understand modern Sweden, we have to also ask the question, what's in it for the citizens, right? So you need also have a from, from below perspective uh, to, to make sense out of this, right? You can't just simply blame modern Sweden if that's what you want to do on trigger happy social engineers um, because the, the responsibility uh, or the glory lies also equally with the citizens. And to understand that, we then um, propose this Swedish theory of love, which is also the, the title of the, of the book. The title in Swedish was As Svenska Människa, Are Swedes Humans? Um, that that you know, goes very well in, in Sweden and even better in Denmark, but uh, it, it, we felt it didn't translate quite as well into English. Uh, but what that is about, right, and that's a theme, a central theme in the book, is that uh, the way Sweden you know, organized modern society uh, was based on this uh, supreme value that was given to individual autonomy uh, and freedom, uh, that even very intimate relationships right, should be organized on the basis of voluntariness, autonomy, and equality, uh, rather than what I think most people would associate with love, interdependence. Right. Uh, so that, that sort of is a partly shocking idea uh, that indeed has been institutionalized in a rather extreme way in Sweden. Um, I'll say more about that in a second as well. So two images here just, just sort of capture Swedish peculiarity, right? And I say peculiarity here with emphasis because there are a lot of Swedes who actually think that Swedes are in some sense normal, but there's absolutely no empirical evidence for that. Uh, they are a really slightly bizarre kind of country, uh, in, but in interesting ways. 
the first image, right, ca captures this uh, business about trust that we already had mentioned here from Camilla. Um, this is uh, European countries organized in terms of uh, the extent to which people trust each other. Right? This is a classic question about where well, you have two answers. Either you say you trust people in general, or you say you can't be careful enough in dealing with other human beings, a more somber perspective. Um, and if we take the country that you can't really read it, but the country in the fifth place there is Great Britain. Um, and if we look down on the scale, it's about 35% uh, who say they trust other people. It's roughly the same number for, for the United States. And then you see there's a, a small group of countries that stick out now really radically. And those are the Nordic countries along with the Netherlands with rates of trust uh, above 60, 70%, which is a huge difference from the rest. Uh, so that also captures some sort of idea that I think is prevalent about the Nordic countries, that they are prone to you know, cooperation, compromises, uh, they prioritize social values and so forth. But it is not the whole story. Um, this other picture here is from a, another survey called World Values Survey that tries to capture uh, global differences around various types of values. And what I'm here interested in primarily, the extent to which in different cultures, uh, the, the, this question of individual freedom and autonomy is central or not. There are two dimensions here. Uh, the, the one that is at the bottom is a tension between survival values and self-expression values. To some extent, the difference between richer and poorer countries. Poorer countries, uh, you place emphasis for obvious reasons on fundamental resources, uh, water, housing, healthcare, schooling, etc. Whereas in richer countries like Sweden or the United States, you take much of that for granted. And instead, the focus is on yourself, right? Self-expression values in terms of you know, realizing yourself, having a career. Some people uh, castigate that form of individualism as some form of egoism or narcissism. But here's important to remember that you can, of course, both want to do something useful with your life, but in a pro-social context. So, so you want to be a little careful with collapsing those categories. Uh, on the other side, uh, we see then the uh, tension between so-called traditional values and so-called secular rational values. The traditional values that are very common around the world are values that are organized around what we can think of as intermediary uh, collectivities, such as the, the family, the extended family, the clan, the ethnic group, the religious community, and so forth. Uh, there's nothing strange about that. That's where we all come from, historically speaking, right? groups of two, three hundred individuals. So this is a very, very, so to speak, normal form of, of association where you have your identity, you, you, you find that you can rely on people, you, you have your relations of, of uh, loyalty and honor and so forth. Uh, at the top, though, um, uh, we have then the uh, secular rational values that we can think of as sort of modern values where instead of viewing, let's say, the family or the group as the base unit in society, you instead look to the individual, right? And then that type of emphasis on, on the individual is also closely related to similar values such as gender equality, rights of children, elderly, rights of minorities, sexual you know, minorities, and so forth. And what's interesting then about Sweden, I don't know, here we go, good, I can point this, is that Sweden is located up here in this corner. So Sweden is extreme in both of these dimensions. Um, and in fact, it's so extreme that many people will argue that if you want to have a global discussion, you should just first eliminate Sweden because it's such an outlier that it's largely irrelevant to the discussion. Uh, on the other hand, it's also true that over time there's a general movement in this direction. Uh, so that this sort of em emphasis, right, on individual freedom is also, in fact, a universal value. You know, m most people around the world, if given an opportunity, prefer to be a little bit more free than less free. Uh, so, so we shouldn't see it as something that is sort of specific to Sweden in that sense. It's primarily more that it's more common there. Um, then, whoops, um, uh, we try to conceptualize that comparatively. As Camilla was pointing out, the book has its origins really <coughs> in me and Henrik both living both in Sweden and Germany, uh, in the United States and Germany for long periods of time. And here we try to sort of summarize these observations in this triangular drama where we have state, 
individual, family, and civil society, and then the three countries. And the point here with Sweden is that the central dominant axis is the one that unites the state with the individual. Uh, this sort of confidence or trust in the state is almost taken for granted in the Nordic countries. But from a global perspective, of course, this is nothing like normal, right? For, for many, many good reasons. Many people around the world view the state and state power with a great deal of suspicion. States are corrupt. They're dominated by elites. They are perhaps downright dangerous to many of their citizens. Uh, so that's something that is not a, you know, universal, but it's very, very uh, uncommon. And, and, and the fact that you see this in Nordic countries is something that needs to be sort of explained, if you will, or understood. Perhaps the most obvious expression of high trust society is the willingness to pay taxes, which brings you sort of back to uh, the social contract. Uh, and that, I think, is what's characteristic here, right? That people in general feel that even though they pay you know, the highest taxes of the world, right? they nonetheless appear by and large, right, while sometimes protesting, still feel that they get something back, right, in the form of social rights, uh, infrastructure investments, and so forth. But it's even more interesting than that, because over time, the state has also served to systematically liberate you know, individuals that have been in subordinate power relations within the traditional institutions the family, one of them, but also institutions in civil society. Uh, so that over time, you know, starting in the 1930s and 40s, but really accelerating in the 1970s, we've seen right, how, for example, the family in Sweden has been transformed into what we can think of as a kind of voluntary association. Um, still often have a man or a woman involved, although not necessarily, right? Uh, but they are expected, and in fact are, by and large, uh, independent, <clears throat> economically independent. One of the most radical laws that was introduced in Sweden in 1970-71 was individual taxation that entirely changed the playing field in terms of uh, women's ability to enter into the labor market, thus have enough money to throw the rascal out when it was necessary, which is about 50% uh, of marriages, right? So it's a very important uh, power. But we also see it <clears throat> with children, uh, the very early laws, you know, establishing uh, children's rights and autonomy, and the elderly. <clears throat> and here things really, you, you arrive at a very good example of the Swedish theory of love. If you ask elderly in Sweden today, what do they prefer? To be dependent on their own adorable children or on the institutions of the state? Uh, they, they answer in a shocking manner that they prefer, right, to be dependent you know, on these uh, of, you know, institutions, uh, welfare institutions of the state. Now, <coughs> I could imagine that they, the reason for that is that they simply know their children where, very well, right? Uh, and that may be true in some cases, but if you ask parent, the elderly if they want their children to visit them, they almost all say yes. So my conclusion is this is not about the, that they don't want to have a relationship is that they want that relationship to be built right, on the basic principles of autonomy and voluntariness rather than duty. Right? So it's a free choice. Okay? And we have a lot of support for that if we look at data on, on, on elderly around the world. Um, so that's sort of one way to understand it. Now, I don't have enough time now, but you know, we, we can certainly, in, maybe in questions, talk a little bit about sort of the difference here. You know? Uh, in the U.S., the dominant axis is the one that connects individual with family and civil society. Here we have a much more critical view of the state. The Constitution is actually organized around limiting state power in relationship to both individuals, families, and institutions in civil society. Germany, the third option, we see the connection between state and family and civil society. So it's like Sweden in emphasizing the state, but there they've organized welfare uh, so in such a way that it follows the principle of subsidiarity, which is a principle from Catholic social thought, which uh, assigns responsibilities at the lower levels of society, like non-profit organizations that provide health care and schooling, and of course the family, which in reality usually means women, right? So it of course has an effect also on gender relations. Um, a couple of things that I think is important that, that we want to take with us when it comes to the, the basis for that social contract um, 
the first one here we see in this election poster from the 1930s period, a little bit like our own, uh, a lot of political unrest, the, the rise of national socialism in Germany, fascism in Italy, coming out of the, the, the depression, so there's a, both an economic and political dimension. In Sweden, <coughs> national socialism never gains any ground, nor in the other Nordic countries, uh, Finland to some extent, but certainly not in Scandinavia. Uh, and the one reason is what we see here, right? The, the development of what we can think of as a form of democratic nationalism. Uh, what it says here that the way of the Swedish people is popular freedom and democracy. And then there is a historical trajectory going back to the person at the bottom, at the first step, uh, Torgny Lawman, a fictional character, but he represents the primacy of rule of law. He stands with his foot on a sword, and I'll symbolize right, that law is always above sheer power. Right? Um, and that principle of law and the centrality of that, we see here in the survey that I carry out on, on, on trust, where we have this question, which is a sort of debated question today in Sweden. What is it important to be counted as a Swede? And we included here, yeah, uh, sort of ethnic alternatives, like to have ancestors from Sweden, you know, to be born in Sweden. And then on the, on the other side, uh, looking from you on the, on the left side, you know, to follow Swedish laws and rules. And as you can see, the, the, the emphasis on law is still today extremely strong, right? Uh, and it's much, much more so in the, the ethnic dimensions. Here, Sweden again sticks out, even compared to the United States. Uh, so, so that, of course, you can think of as a kind of a hopeful perspective in a, in, a, in, a, in a period of migration, right? But it's also true that that emphasis on law uh, is demanding, right? Because those laws are not innocent, right? They are expressions, of course, right, of culturally embedded values. Uh, so it sort of cuts both ways. It's op both open and demanding at the same time. <clears throat> and connected to that intimately is the centrality of work the wholesome worker, right, as a sort of legendary figure, you know, going back to the Swedish popular movements in the late 19th century. And this, this emphasis on work, you know, is absolutely central to the social contract. In some sense, it's very simple. You know, citizens who work, pay taxes, earn rights, right? And virtually nobody, you know, in Sweden would argue against that. And that, you know, is something that is, has a potential to include people. Uh, this right and duty to work, right, was central to get away from charity, right, and philanthropy, and instead establish universal civil social rights, right? But it was also something that had an exclusionary function. The woman that you see in that picture is one of the women who were forcibly sterilized in Sweden in the 1940s and 50s. And they, when you look closely to these women, they were women who in, in various ways failed to live up to these ideals. Right? They might have been prostitutes, they might have been uh, single mothers, they might have been travelers. Uh, there, there were a series of categories that sort of fell outside of the social contract. And today in Sweden, we have another group like that, particularly refugee uh, immigrants who come to Sweden without the type of cultural uh, capital and, and language skills necessary to enter into the labor market. So it kind of cuts both ways, my point here. Um, this is today still extremely important values. We also have a question here. What's important to consider another person as trustworthy, right? And over there, the first alternative that scores the highest is to be, is this at var you know, to be you know, wholesome, reliable. And that's in turn connected to honesty and willingness to work, right, and not to cheat. Uh, so, so these values are today extremely strong in Sweden. Um, Finally, I'm going to, um, yeah, I, I'm going to skip these, but I, I, I just very briefly just note just how important, you know, the idea of gender equality has become in Sweden as part of our uh, sense of national identity. Now, this is the original model, the Myrdal family from the 1940s. They are on their way to the United States where Gunnar Myrdal writes this very famous book. Uh, 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 on the question of, of, of uh, you know, s or coming out of slavery, the question about, uh, uh, you know, finding equality and inclusion. Um, and, of course, Pippi, I'm not going to say much more, but she is sort of the ultimate symbol of this, right? Uh, and, you know, if you think about her, uh, from a point of view of a social worker, she's an interesting figure, right? Her mother is dead. Her father is a vagrant somewhere in the South Sea Island. 
Um, how can a social welfare case become the very symbol, right, of the ultimate of the free and independent individual? Well, you can think of that little, you know, sack of gold that she has there in the middle as a symbol of the welfare state, right, whose primary, you know, objective, right, is to ensure that children, even those who come from poor circumstances, will have a chance to realize themselves in a modern market society. Um, so, um, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave this image here because I have another image after that that I think you and I will have an opportunity to talk about a little bit later. So, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let's go back to this uh, curious paradox uh, that you speak about that has to do with uh, uh, the, the dependency on the state in Sweden and the dependency on the family in the US. Um, I want to ask you if you can elaborate a little bit more on these forms of dependency and what distinct forms of precarity uh, do these family state dependencies generate in the US and Sweden, respectively? Yeah. Well, it's a good question, really, because, you know, what, what got me started in this whole project, right, you know, was when I was, uh, you know, 17, 18, and I was uh, in the United States for a year going to school, and I went to California, where I wanted to really be. Um, and I went to visit, uh, sorry, visit a whole series of colleges and universities along the West Coast. And um, I had the same question to all of them, which was very straightforward. At first, I made a sort of a cocky assumption that, I, that you would probably accept me on academic merits. But I said, my real question is about money. You know, how will I pay for this? Because even back then, right, American college was pretty expensive, fair. And, um, and then they explained to me that at where I ended up, Pomona College, which was the only college that accepted foreigners on equal terms with, uh, you know, U.S. residents. Right? So I asked them, so what, what can we do? So I said, oh, no problem. We have financial aid. And I said, I like that. I like the sound of that a lot. Um, how do I get it? So they gave me uh, two sets of forms to fill out. And the first one was very easy for me because it was all about my income and my wealth. And that was like a couple of zeros and a signature and I was done. Uh, the other one though was about my parents. And I said, well, what do they have to do with this? You know, I'm an adult now. And so I have no economic relations to, to my parents. And in fact, that's the laws in Sweden had changed a number of years earlier, right? To remove right, any consideration or parental income when you determine financial aid for students, right? Uh, so they, of course, then explained to me, you know, they start to speak more slowly, right? Because they figure I didn't quite get it, that, you know, here in America, you know, families are, and parents are just really happy, you know, to fork over, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every year for their wonderful children. And this is a normal thing to do because this is a family responsibility, right? So then I said to them, and this, this goes to this question of power. And I said, that's the, these sound ex extraordinarily wonderful people. Um, but I said, isn't there a problem, right? Let's suppose, right, that you want to study, the, the students want to study something extremely useless, right? Let's say like medieval ballads or history. Or, and, and the parents then say, well, you know, we're willing to support you if you do something useful, something that actually makes sense in terms of your adult life, like, for example, pre-law, pre-medicine, study business, economics, something that you can actually stand some little chance of making some money eventually. And I said, would that not be an undue exercise of power over me as an adult individual, as an autonomous individual? Right? And then, of course, they looked at me like I was from Mars, and I sort of closed down that conversation. But that's what, it, what got me started. And then what I've been telling a lot of my American friends is that you know, sometimes I feel like when American talks about rugged individualism, they're actually really talking about anti-statism, is that they don't like the state, but they are very happy to submit individuals to dependency and, and unequal power relations in other collectivities, right, like the family. Right? And, and that sort of was a key point, you know, for us when we did this comparison. So let's move on to, so you know, the book, Lars, actually makes it quite explicit that you're not trying to make a regional argument, right? You're telling the reader that this is about Sweden, 
<laughs> um, and still, I'd like to push a little bit on this point and ask how you think the book is in conversation with uh, existing regional literature about the Nordic model. What does it bring to this conversation? And also, how does it help us anticipate the future of Nordic countries as a, what we could call a global frontier of liberal democracy in the 21st century? I do would like to also loop in actually Camilla's point that she made earlier when we were speaking about uh, citizens' trust in the state mm -hmm. in the Nordic countries. But mm -hmm. Camilla mm -hmm. made the, mm -hmm. the clever yeah. point to also think about what about states' trust in its citizens. Yep. And can we think about that within a larger regional conversation as yeah. well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, yeah, no, these are really important questions. And I, first of all, I, I think your first sort of probing of sort of Sweden in the region is, is a good one, right? Uh, the reason was quite simple, right? You know, we, we both Henrik and I are historians working a lot with other Nordic historians. <clears throat> and what we realized was that uh, what was happening a lot was what uh, Sigmund Freud called the narcissism of minor differences, right? That is to say, with preoccupation uh, with difference. Uh, so that even though if you stood, if you drove down to, you know, into Germany, crossed the border down there and looked back, you know, things looked fairly similar, right? You know, you can say that there was more that united than divided uh, the Nordics. But when you are within that kind of conversation, oftentimes if you make too broad of a statement, especially as a Swede back in those days, right? This is before the Norwegians became filthy rich, right? So then Sweden was sort of the big brother. So we wanted to avoid that discussion. We could, we didn't want to make claims that went beyond what we ourselves really had some evidence for. So that's the reason we chose right, to, to downplay that. There is a book that was published not too long ago by Anu Partanen, uh, who tries to sort of, they, she uses our work a lot. You know, I, I'm in there and she's using our theories, but she tries to expand it to a Nordic level. So she talks about the Nordic theory of love, for example, right? So, so I think it's a perfectly legitimate exercise, but uh, just we chose not to do it for the reason that I, you know, you're su suggesting. There was no big principle there. We just felt we were better off, you know, focusing on what we actually knew. Um, so that was that. The other question that you talk about, of course, is also really, really interesting, and, and, and it is clear from that first graph that I showed, right? The Nordic countries that really uh, belong to a cluster uh, of small, high trust countries in the world, and. I usually point out that there are three dimensions, really, of trust, right? There is the social trust between uh, the individual citizens, if you will, in a society. Um, and that's what we usually refer to social trust, right? And then there is the trust we have in our common institutions, right? That sometimes we sort of generalize that as talking about the state. Um, and, and that may often talk, talk about sort of the confidence, you know, in, in, in institutions. And that's studied a lot by political scientists. But what I have tried to sort of add to that trust discussion is this trust that the state would have in its own citizens. I mean, there's something that became very obvious during the pandemic, right? You know, that you know, uh, the Swedish state chose in a way to trust that the citizens at this point were they were not babies, they were not children, right? You know, they they were able right to act in themselves. And that degree of sort of offering, right, that type of trust in the citizens is equally important, right, in, in, in the trust relationship, you know, at large. The trust may, of course, be misplaced, but, you know, to test it before you sort of remove it, right, is, 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 is the important thing. So when the Nordic countries operate at their best, right, you have all of these three dimensions of trust operating. And uh, the beauty with that is, is, aside from trust being a positive value in itself, it also diminishes in what we often refer to as the uh, transaction costs in a society. You know, think about the United States where you have extremely now low trust in, in our, the common institutions, right? You know, what that means, right, you know, in terms of the enormous costs, right, in the, in the political life here right now that, that trust, uh, distrust creates. And it, but it's also true in economic relations. Uh, you know, if you don't trust other people, you have to have insurances, you have lawyers, you have to protect yourself uh, against, right, uh, untrustworthy companies, individuals, and so forth. All of that costs a lot of money. Uh, so 
I sometimes I argue, like I joke a little bit, say the only reason that we can afford this very expensive welfare state is our transaction costs in other domains are much, much lower, right? So there is also this uh, economic dimension along with this sort of just social dimension that has been very good. And, and that is now under threat. You know, we, we may come to that a little bit later, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a, an ideal typical situation that I'm describing to you uh, that is, is increasingly not you know, as ideal, certainly not in Sweden right now, where we see a lots of question marks on the horizon. Okay, yes, thank you for that, because let's now turn to whether it is becoming under threat, because I'll turn my attention to the audience just to um, include you in what is coming up. So on September 11, last month, uh, the Sweden Democrats won 20% of the votes in the general election and became the second biggest party in the country. The party is known for its Nazi affiliations dating back to uh, the Second World War. Party representatives have actively sought to distance themselves uh, from this past, identifying mostly as a more conventional national conservative party. The party's raison d'etre remains intact, however, to recreate the demographic homogeneity of Sweden. And here I'm quoting from the Korean-Swedish commentator Dr. Tobias Hubinette in the Boston Review article from last week. Uh, Lars, can you tell us more about uh, the historical context within which the Sweden Democrats have emerged? And how did this historical context at the same time condition the possibility for the Swedish theory of love to emerge? Mm -hmm. mm? Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really, really, really a pertinent question. You know, so I'm really happy you, you put that in. And you know, we, we've been cheating. We had a little bit of a conversation before. <laughs> um, I, that's why I le left this picture here. So I, I thought we, we could try to give a sort of a, a slightly deeper historical understanding of, of uh, to try to understand why, how we got to where we are today. And right? uh, you know, when I talked about the Swedish social contract, it was a story very much about the national, right? You know, there was this uh, social contract between citizens and it, the people's home was, you know, a deliberately, you know, a form of national democracy and not national welfare. Um, but that was not starting, you know, after the Second World War, the only, right, uh, uh, kind of story that was being told about Sweden. There was a kind of a secondary narrative uh, that evolved uh, in the beginning, uh, the consequences of the Second World War, you know, so it, Sweden's neutrality, uh, which involved activities that were perceived, you know, as morally problematic, even shameful, right? The uh, uh, trade with iron ore with Nazi Germany, uh, the allowing German troop movement going through Sweden to northern Norway, a relatively, you know, uh, closed border to. Jewish refugees trying to flee Germany and so forth. And after the war, these two characters that we have here, Dag Hammarskjöld here and Olaf Palme, uh, start to elaborate a new idea for Sweden in the global stage, right? Uh, Dag Hammarskjöld was a deeply religious man for him. The idea of human rights really uh, was rooted in uh, a very, you know, religious idea of all people's equal standing and relationship in the eyes of God, right? So for him, this was a very natural way of thinking about it. And he then started to think about that the one way for Sweden to sort of pay back, right, uh, what it owed through its, you know, guilt during the war was uh, that they should play a more active role in the global stage, particularly with, with respect to peace and also the sort of struggles to liberate, you know, you know, all these countries that were colonized in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so forth. And, th and this was a project that Olaf Palme, you know, probably the most famous Swedish uh, prime minister, social democrat, uh, he continued in a, in a perhaps more modern secular form uh, and invested himself very much in this sort of, you know, fight for the rights of the countries in the so-called third world, which was the expression back then. Um, and he became very involved also in creating this kind of uh, in big investment, right, in, in aid projects, in, not least through CEDA, which was this organization. So we start to see the emergence, this, this new idea of Sweden, not just simply as a national project, but as a moral superpower on the world stage, right? And, and this becomes a, an important complement. Um, 
However, <coughs> what we see today, right, in this final slide here, uh, is an attempt on my part, right, to try to lay bare exactly the uh, sort of answer your question, right? You know, why are we where we are now? And uh, we have two, two sort of uh, tables here that try to show the ways, right, in which these two ideas, right, the national welfare state on the one hand and the global moral superpower, uh, uh, stand in some degree of tension with each other. I mean, for many Swedes, I would say these are almost synonymous, right? You know, it's ideas, you know, we want to create a good society, so we create a welfare state. We want to do the same thing globally, so we support human rights uh, and all, all, uh, various types of aid projects. But if we look more carefully here under the rubric of citizenship here and human rights, you know, which Anna always thought, you know, put it out since I know that you are very much involved with that. Uh, we see here that the logics differ in a, in a deep way. So this model here, right, the national welfare state based on the idea of citizenship, it relies on this very simple logic of, you know, you know do your duty, earn your rights, right? Work, taxes, rights, connected with each other. Uh, it is a principle at heart of reciprocity, right? A form of what I call here, you know, a conditional form of altruism. And the welfare state is best thought of as a huge insurance company. Everybody has to pay in here. Right? And it's operating within a bounded nation state, okay? Um, like any insurance company, right? There are boundaries, right? You have to pay in. Uh, human rights, on the other hand, is based on a very different idea, right? Of intrinsic, right? And universal rights connected to people uh, by virtue of being human beings, right? And when it comes to wanting to then do something good, uh, it translates into forms of aid and charity right? and an unconditional form of altruism. SIDA, you can say, is an example of that. If you take a Syrian refugee entering Sweden from Denmark in 2015, the first question asked was not, have you paid Swedish taxes? The idea, right, was that we followed a different moral logic. And that logic constituted also a challenge against the national state. Uh, the ideas of global civil society, no borders ideas, right? Foundation for a new type of idealism that emerges after the fall of the wall uh, becomes very critical. And, uh, but these logics then conflict with each other. Uh, this perspective indeed starts to become more and more critical of the bounded nation state, which is viewed as forms of welfare chauvinism, uh, uh, of z maybe even xenophobic, a, a whiteness regime, and so forth, right? So, so we, we start to build these like tensions between these projects that are largely unresolved in Sweden, right? And we have seen how most of the parties other than the Sweden Democrats, right, have sort of invested themselves in this story here, right? Um, Whereas uh, the only party that really sort of remained fully uh, invested in the, the, the nation state based on citizenship and, and these logical principles that we see here were the Sweden Democrats. Uh, and so what has happened in recent years is that we are now starting to see the consequences in Sweden of relatively unthought through immigration policies combined with neoliberal reforms of the welfare state. And the problems that fa Sweden is facing right now are substantial, right? You know, when, you, when you look right, at segregation, unemployment, particularly among refugee immigrants, uh, also gang violence, you know, crime, murder rates, etc. cetera. Uh, it, it, these are big problems. Uh, that you know, many people then uh, feel convinced that the, the, the kind of story or explanation right, provided by the Sweden Democrats uh, seems more convincing right, than the lack of a convincing story that the other parties have been producing, and particularly the Social Democrats. Because you remember, right, this project here was very much a social democratic project. And if you look more closely at what Sweden Democrats are saying today, is quite similar, right, to what social democrats used to say. They were the champions of 
national democracy, uh, democratic nationalism, and so forth. The difference, which you pointed to, right, is that whereas Per Albin Hansson and the Sweden, Sweden Social Democrats were very, very careful and clear about emphasizing that it was not an ethnic understanding of the nation, uh, you know, when they talk about the people's home, they also talk about the home of citizens, right? So it was a civic understanding. The Sweden Democrats, which you pointed out, have different roots, and they are, are much more tending much, much more to kind of emphasize a more ethnic understanding, right? So that's the difference. So they are similar, but they are also different in a crucial dimension. Uh, so that's where we stand right now. So the big question is, right, will Social Democrats and the other parties uh, become more, I would say, pragmatic, more realistic about these crucial policies that we regards integration, uh, uh, immigration, uh, welfare, social contract, uh, or will they you know, give even more ground to the Sweden Democrats? That, that's where we are right now. These are very serious and very difficult questions. I've, I cannot for myself decide whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist from day to day. Yes, I agree. As a Danish person, I agree. Um, all good things must come to an end. If it were up to me, I would love to speak another hour about this question alone that we have just been through. Um, we do have eight to ten minutes left, so I want to just test the water to see if there are anyone here who would like to pose a question. We would love to hear from you. I feel compelled to say, please don't hold back. All questions are welcome. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much for coming. I learned so much. I uh, really like this chart here. Um, thank you so much, Lars. I'm just curious, uh, what do you think was the main reason why, like, Social Democrat now moved from, you know, citizenship towards human rights and kind of abandoned the left side of, the, of this chart here? Uh, talk to me. Yeah, excellent question. You know, um, I, I, I think part of the story really is um, that when you look at uh, what's going on in the 1980s in Sweden, starting really in the 70s, you see how the Social Democrats run out of steam, right? You have an economic crisis. They sort of lose their way. Uh, not just them, you know, uh, many other parties around Europe do. And with the fall of the wall, right, that's sort of the end, in if you will, not just of communism, but it's also end in some sense, right, of classical social democracy. And they start searching, right, for for something else, essentially. And, 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 and there's a lot of youthful enthusiasm for the human rights ideas. I remembered, I was at Columbia, I was at Barnard when these things happened, and I remember the shift, right? You see like how young people got super excited about the, these ideas of global solidarity and so forth. And I think that the Social Democrats in Sweden, they sort of lost their way in a very deep, deep sense, right? And they try to become sort of part of the new wave in a confused kind of way, while still trying to adhere to running the state, you know, the Swedish welfare state. And, and they've been sort of wandering around in the wilderness ever since. Right? Uh, and they are not really unlike many other parties of, of a similar type. Uh, but um, they, they may be, in some sense, right, you know, facing the, the deepest challenge right now, because Sweden has gone very far in this direction. I mean, if you compare, I mean, your original question about the Nordic, I think, is so important right now, right? because if you compare Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Finland, Sweden really sticks out here, right? You know, the other Nordic countries have, have been much, much more conservative, right? Uh, both when it comes to organization and welfare, and when it comes to immigration and, and, and integration questions, right? So the Swedish Social Democrats were part of a kind of fairly radical turn, right? That they hadn't really thought through terribly well. And I hope now that they're gonna have a break for four years and they will sit and think a little bit more than just being preoccupied with having power. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's my sort of at least tentative understanding of it historically. Thank you so much for that question. Are there any other? Yeah, I see you down by the yeah. end. And then one here, too. Yeah. There, in the back, yeah. and then Camilla. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Hello. Nice to hear my voice in this room. I'm just kidding. Um, so I was thinking since, you know, Sweden is, since Swedish people are so individualistic, 
What do you think are some challenges we face when we move outside of our country and like try to integrate into another culture? Like for example, me moving here, I've spent most of my um, adult, I mean all my adult life here really, you know? Mm. What are some challenges do you think for Swedish people trying to integrate to another country? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I think this is a question of fit. all migrants face this question, right? Because no matter where you move, right, you're going to move into a new environment, and there's the culture is a real thing, and, and there's going to be differences, and they are also not just values; they are also practices. Uh, you know, tax law, right? I mean, I don't know if you thought about it, but uh, you know, when you do pay your taxes in this country, right? <clears throat> you get your tax form. The first question is, are you head of household? Now, imagine that question, you know, in, in Swedish, you know what? Uh, and if you were to say yes, right, uh, then the next question is, how many dependents do you have? Now, that's like would be even worse, right? Uh, but if for in America, of course, you know, having as many dependents is, 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 the, is the name of the game because that will lower your taxes. Because the whole tax structure is built around, you know, the idea of the family as the base unit in society. Uh, so I think there's so many different levels, right? That your question plays itself out from daily life expectations of parents in schools, for example, um, you know, of involvement as opposed to you know, sort of Swedish schools where you have a bit more of a sort of a standoffish view of, of parents. You know, the whole thing about parental rights versus children's rights. Remember, America hasn't even signed on. Uh, the, the, the Declaration on the Rights of the Child. Uh, in Sweden, we, we basically have a law against homeschooling on religious ground, or homeschooling at period. In America, homeschooling on religious ground is a constitutional right because the idea is that you should be able to transfer your own beliefs and faith to your own children, right? Uh, so, I mean, there are so many different ways, you know, both superficial and deep, right, where I think over time, right, you know, you are confronted with, with these super interesting differences. I mean, that certainly was a story of my life here uh, for, for 40 years. I could go on, but, you know, I'm not going to do that. We can talk about it over cocktails afterwards, but it is a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was surprised not to see Norway up on that chart uh, of countries that have a high trust in um, in, um, in authorities. Uh, was that because it was only EU countries that were measured? Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, indeed. So uh, then my second question. We should be very happy that they weren't there because not only do they have all the oil, they also have really high levels of trust. So. Okay. <laughs> They beat us there as well. Uh, my second question is, could you expand a bit on why you think Sweden chose a different path when it came to the pandemic? <coughs> yeah, that's <coughs> it's a, it's a hard question. Um, because um, if you go back to, um, and, and there's, uh, there's a historian, uh, Peter Baldwin has written about both cholera and the AIDS epidemic, you know, and, and then he was also interested in, in the recent, you know, corona pandemic. And, what is so interesting here with Sweden, right? And you remember I said in the beginning, I fled Sweden because I felt it was so super paternalist. And I, 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 was, I, I was born as an American libertarian, so I wanted to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. Now, if you look, right, that's how Sweden responded to the cholera epidemics of the late 19th century or the AIDS you know, epidemic in the 1980s, uh, you would have thought that Swedish corona policy would have been, should have been the most draconian in the entire world. So it's a huge surprise to all historians and political scientists who, who believe right, in sticky structure and path dependency. Uh, and you know, my, my only you know, thought here, which I have to say is tentative, right, is that I think that Sweden has experienced since, really, uh, the 1980s, uh, a shifting of the balance between the individual and the state, right? So the fundamental logic is still there. State's role, right, is to maximize the space for individual freedom and autonomy. But we have decreased, right, the space for overt statist paternalism, right? And we've seen that in reforms in the, in the welfare sector. We, we can actually even think of that as part of what's going on with immigration policies, right? Uh, and certainly when it comes to the pandemic, right, we, we see like that this sort of idea, right, that you do not just sort of in a knee-jerk fashion uh, uh, sort of pose a lockdown, right? You know? 
that there is a sort of a newfound respect for you know civil liberties and individual freedom. But it is a huge surprise historically, and, and the only way I can you know explain myself is for these structural shifts that we see in many other areas, right? That you know you see the signs in the 80s, but it really accelerates in the 1990s, and uh, that the, this response is a part of that general trend. Uh, but as I said, this this is just my very tentative thoughts on that topic. It's a super interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.